Hello, this is Dr. Lukes, and this is a continuation of our missed class from uh, ChemEng 4096, Engineering Economics. In this lesson, we're going to be starting to look at Chapter 1, which is Diagrams for Understanding Chemical Processes. And what we're going to go over in this lesson is going to be just simply block flow diagrams and process flow diagrams. We're, the chapter is going to go on and look at PNIDs and some other types of diagrams that will be very important to us. We're going to stop at the two that you have done in the past, and then we will have time in class to look with some detail at PNIDs and other diagrams. Block flow diagrams are what you learned how to do in mass and energy balances. They are simple blocks and arrows. So for instance, if you have this little process here, uh, toluene and hydrogen are converted in a reactor to produce benzene and methane. The reaction does not go to completion and excess toluene is required. The non-condensable gases are separated and discharged. The benzene product and the unreacted unre toluene are then separated by distillation. The toluene is then recycled back to the reactor and the benzene removed in the product stream. So we know from our earlier courses that we can draw a little box that's a reactor, another box that's going to be the separation process, and we're going to draw arrows of our feed streams. We'll have a recycle going back. We'll have product streams. And in fact, it might end up looking something like this. Okay, They're very simple. You don't need to be artistic. We try to make them go from left to right, and we try and uh, make it as streamlined and simple to follow as possible. Notice that the lines are all labeled. Any really important information is given in the diagram, and the reaction is listed. Now these can get more complicated, so if, when you try and do this for a complete plant, <clears throat> what you see is that you have all sorts of little sub-processes here and many, many materials that are fed in and products. But again, we simplify things by making it all go as much as possible from left to right. <clears throat> we have recycle streams shown. We've Instead of labeling so many things on the diagram itself, we've taken most of them and given stream numbers, okay? So that then we can refer to another chart to get a better idea of what's going on. And this is a block flow diagram. So our general conventions for these are just, we're gonna show all of the operations that we wish to show using just a simple square or rectangle. All the major flow lines are shown and we put arrows on them to show which direction the flow is going. We try whenever possible to go from left to right. When we have a choice where we have two materials leaving the same device, we try to put the light one, the gas, coming from the top and the heavy one, a liquid or a solid, more towards the bottom. We are gonna include any critical information and then there's a little trick there that when we have two lines that cross, so I have one line that goes like this, and then I have another one that's trying to get up this way. If I just draw that and I didn't see the path being drawn, like it's in print, <clears throat> then that's a little confusing. So one of the conventions is that they do this. And if there's no arrow on a line that breaks, then that means look across the line for the continuation. This is the convention of the book. You'll see other places where they're going to do the line and they'll do like a little jumper like that. Either one is perfectly fine. Usually enough information is provided in this diagram or in a table attached to the diagram so that you can complete simple material balances. A process flow diagram is similar to this, but it's going to expand upon what's in the block flow diagram to include all the major pieces of equipment, every flow stream. It's also going to include utility streams. So if I need heat to, or steam to heat my reboiler, 
then I'm going to draw that steam line. If I need cooling water for a chiller, then I'm going to include those things. I also will include some basic control loops. Now this is not a complete control system drawn on here. This should include the key items. <clears throat> now you may sometimes, because these things get rather complex very quickly, uh, move some items to separate pages. So maybe the equipment summary table on a complex system may move to a second page or a flow summary table or utility tables. All of those things need to be included, but they may not be specifically in the diagram itself unless it's a fairly simple system you're looking at. So this is an example that's in the book. We'll be looking at this one many times. Um, this is a little PFD for the production of benzene via hydrodealkylation of toluene. And you see that they've listed across the top all of the various pieces of equipment. So this here from, is for this vessel right here. Here's a pump, I've got a furnace here, and so forth. All the pieces of equipment are listed across here. And then the flow streams are numbered using little diamond shapes. <clears throat> They also, for my feed materials, use a circle with a colored in on the left side. And for products, they use a circle with colored in on the right side. Okay, so that's going to be a convention that they use. For the equipment, there are, well, I'm just going to say every company sort of has their own standard. But these are the most common standards for equipment symbols. So heat exchangers can look like just a circle with a little heat line through it, or they can show you what the type of heat exchanger is. So this first one here is just a shell and tube heat exchanger, and this one here is going to be boiling the system. So I've got expanded space here for my uh, vapor space. Fired heaters are going to show a chimney so that you can have a flue gas leaving. Storage tanks can have different forms. Pumps, lots of different forms. Uh, I tend to use this one here. I tend to use this one for compressors, for gases. Towers, whether or not you're using packing or whether you're using trays. Okay, where I'm going to put little trays across there. Or sometimes I just leave it empty and that indicates trays. Just a vessel where it's kind of nondescript inside. It's like a tank with a purpose. And reactors, again, depending on whether or not I'm using something that I'm trying to maybe model as a sea star or a plug flow reactor, etc. Valves look like bow ties. If they are for control purposes, then we're going to put a little bonnet on them. If they have just a little T on the top, that means it is for manual control. Stream numbers again in diagonals, and instruments are going to be indicated with circles. Again, this is going to be somewhat company dependent, but in general, most of the time, they're going to use C for compressors or turbines. They are essentially just reverses of each other. E for exchangers and H for heater. We kind of separate these two out because a fired heater is very different in construction uh, and operation from a heat exchanger that is a more passive device. Uh, pumps, reactors, towers, tanks, they use a TK for those, V for vessel. Sometimes you will have within the plant. So we have the type of equipment here. We need to designate that, oh, this is in unit one as opposed to unit two. Okay. So you'd put something to designate that there. Usually this is a number. And then the ZZ is to indicate like this is the first pump in this unit or the 87th pump in this unit. And then A, B, we don't always include this, but frequently we're going to have installed spares on 
reasonably inexpensive things or items that require a lot of repair or a lot of maintenance, uh, cleaning. And so on items that we have installed spares, we're going to designate those as being A, B, maybe A, B, C. And so therefore, on our diagram, we'll just list it as A slash B, meaning that both of them are there. So we know that we have two pieces of equipment there. We also, for really critical uh, process conditions, we're going to want to identify those on the flow lines. They, we want those to be on the diagram in the most compact way possible. A lot of times this is done using flags. I think they look like Dr. Seuss hats, but the flags, each different piece of information has a different shape. So a temperature is a rectangle, uh, pressure is going to be a trapezoid, and so forth. So these things, and you just kind of stack them on top of each other, whichever ones you needed. So if it's really important that you get the temperature right or the flow rate right, then you're going to indicate those using these flags. I said that we're gonna to need to include utilities on our diagram. So utilities are mostly steam, cooling water, refrigerated water, uh, maybe wastewater, boiler feed water, maybe our fuels for those furnaces. And so the standard abbreviations are listed in this table. We also are going to be wanting to include information about the equipment. We want to know what size it is, what it's made out of. This table 1.6 lists the key things that you need to know about a piece of equipment at this level of a design. So for a tower, for instance, you need the height and diameter. You need the pressure and temperature that it's designed to operate. Uh, if it's for distillation, how many trays and what type of trays? Maybe it's packed, so the height and type of packing. What materials are you going to be using for this tower? And you can go through these and see the sort of information that you need to specify before your design is completed for every piece of equipment in your design. The flow summary is going to basically be a table that's organized like how I do my mass and energy balance class, where you're gonna have stream numbers and then the important information about that stream. So it's gonna be things like how much of each component, what's the flow rate, but so that we can also do this for energy balances, we want to be sure to include temperatures and pressures and you know, possibly other information, like sometimes volumetric flow rate is really key, or density. If we're wanting to monitor something for density, then you would want to list that in your table. Here is an example for the uh, benzene process for the first 19 streams in that or in that diagram and then these are equipment summaries for these and they were able to make this more compact by grouping each type together so the heat exchangers uh, each of these were shell and tube they've said something about what's on the shell side versus what's on the tube side what's the surface area What's the heat duty? Okay, so they've got all of that information in a summary there for the heat exchanger. For the vessels, same stuff. Notice that it's important now to talk about whether they're going to be uh, horizontal or vertical. And what's the material of construction? MOC is material of construction in this case. Carbon steel or 316 stainless steel are the two that they're highlighting there. What type of internals do you have? What's the height? What's the diameter? Pumps and compressors. It's going to be important what type it is. What's the power requirement? What's the efficiency? Okay. And then they do have the key down here so that you'll learn over time what these things mean. But you do need to learn that.
And again, this is the diagram that we've been talking about, and we will continue to refer back to this. In class on Thursday, we'll be coming in and specifically looking at this diagram and learning what some of these things mean, make sure that we can read this, and we'll come back to this uh, multiple times throughout the semester. So this concludes this video lesson. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing you guys in class on Thursday.